I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the Webby-nominated podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I am very, very excited to be interviewing Stephen A. Schwarzman today, who is the chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Blackstone, one of the world's leading investment firms, and the author of What It Takes, Lessons in the Pursuit of Excellence. He is an active philanthropist with a focus on education, culture, and the arts. He's the founder of the Schwarzman Scholars Program in China. He currently lives in New York, and he's my dad. So welcome, Dad. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Well, it's great to be here. <laughs> Can you please tell listeners what What It Takes is about and what inspired you to write this book? Well, What, what It Takes is, is about what I've learned and would like to pass on to younger people, people working in organizations, people who start organizations, and people who run organizations so that they can do a better job, so they can be more successful, so that they can have fuller lives, and so the world can be a better place. And that's why I wrote it. You know, the small, the, small goal. Well, we <laughs> have uh, ambitious goals and a fun story. And then the book is a is a very quick read. A lot of people tell me they laugh a lot, and the reason is, you know, I've failed at a lot of things. Not all things, obviously, or there wouldn't be a book. But part of the reason I wrote the book is so people learn that when things don't go well, that's the time that they can learn how to do better. It's Successes don't teach you anything. You just do them. But when something goes wrong, it's because you, you miss something. And you really need to confront that. And if you're working with a group of people, they need to stop and figure out what did we do wrong and how do we fix that for the future? Not on that one situation, but what have we learned? Because being successful, it, is, it requires a a lifetime learning model. And, and so I, I wanted to show people you know, how, how to do that yeah, and, and simple skills, like how to take an interview and, and how do you behave in an interview and what is the other person looking for, as well as instructing the people who are doing interviews. How do you find somebody who's the right fit for your organization or, or situation? And there are so many different things that are experience-based where other people are doing them either for the first time or not so well, or they're anxious about it. And so it's a little bit of a how-to, but it's a disguised a bit with the story of how I went through things like that. And, and I managed to learn and you know, figured out how to create a culture where people are happy and productive and and, you know, sort of don't leave and are excellent at what they do. So, Dad, in the book, you say that when people ask you the secret to success, basically, your answer is, I see a unique opportunity and I go for it with everything I have and I never give up. So my question is, well, what if it's not that good an idea? How do you know when it, you should let go of an idea and when you shouldn't? Well, it's, it's really about going forward. When should you go forward with something and how do you assess how good something is. And that's the most important thing in almost any form of human activity where you're trying to achieve something. And you have to look at every idea and say, is this unique? Or is this just repeating what other people do, hoping I could do it a tiny bit better? The, wor the world doesn't much care about doing something everybody else does a tiny bit better because they're already being served by someone else. Uh, and, and so you, you, you have to look at something that's, that's a bit paradigm shifting. But if you're too early, no one will adopt it. If you're too late, other people have done it, so you're offering nothing unique. And, and, and so you have to be very objective about what you attempt to do. And you have to not do things just because they'll be successful. The question is, how successful will they be? Because if you pick one, that's what you're doing. And you'll miss the other ones because you're enmeshed in what you picked. So, so in my experience, the, the most important thing, I, I call them worthy fantasies. They're worthy of your time. They're worthy of the effort to create them. And a lot of this is produced 
before you do anything. Actually doing things isn't as hard if you have a great vision of something you're trying to do. You'll also be able to recruit people easier to something that is in effect inspirational or, or new rather than something that they're almost doing before and already being well paid for it. So, so th there's no you know, rigid way of knowing whether you'll be right or wrong. And if you're failing, you, you have to adapt. You have to change your execution, but you always have to monitor whether the vision is right. If, if you realize that you've made a mistake on the vision, you're done. You won't achieve stuff by trying harder. But if the vision is good, you know, sort of a, I have a friend in China who started a company called Alibaba, which is one of the biggest in the world. And he said he almost went bankrupt twice. He, he had a vision, but he didn't really know how to get there and was inexperienced. He was an English teacher. And, you know, that's where, where you never give up because the vision was exactly right, but the execution was flawed. You, you don't keep doing the same thing and knocking your head against a wall if you are not ever going to make that sale. You find a different way. You adapt. Excellent advice. I can apply that to a lot of different areas. <laughs> Thank you very much. Your rule number four in the 25 rules for work and life, which you include at the end of the book, is there is nothing more interesting to people than their own problems. Think about what others are dealing with and try to come up with ideas to help them. Almost anyone, however senior or important, is receptive to new ideas provided they are thoughtful. And then number 10, which is very similar, sort of similar, you said people in a tough spot often focus on their own problems when the answer usually lies in fixing someone else's. So both of these have to do with listening and figuring out what motivates other people. Tell me a little more about that and how powerful it can be. Yeah, it's really powerful in the sense that everyone is in their own world. And I remember I, I, uh, when I was sort of in my 40s, I was at the White House for something. And the president then was George H.W. Bush. And, you know, I had met him once or twice. And... You know, I spend 10 minutes talking to him, which is a lot when somebody's a president and you're in your 40s and you have no connection with what they're really doing for their job because there was something going on in the world I had thought a lot about that I knew was one of the top things on his mind. And it's very simple. Once you start talking to somebody about something that's of interest to them, where they haven't figured out exactly what to do yet, you, you'll, you'll find you can interact with anyone until you know, you've, you've presented what you have to as soon, as fast as you can, and then they go, okay, I've, I, that's really useful. I've, I've figured it out. If they want to take the dialogue further, they will do that. But almost anyone will focus on things that are important to them if somebody else as something productive or interesting to add to their thought process. I was surprised to learn in the book, and there weren't, I mean, I guess there were some things I was surprised to learn. I feel like I had heard a lot of stories. Now I feel I have no unique stories about you in your past, but that's okay. I, I can live with that. You said you learned how to use your breathing to make your thoughts clearer in times of stress and how you would focus on your breathing, slow it down, relax your shoulders, make your breaths long and deep. And you said, the effect was astonishing. My thoughts became clear. I became more objective and rational about the situation at hand, about what I needed to do to win. Now, obviously, mindfulness and all this is very popular. But to hear it from you, it seems very different because you don't usually talk about all of that. So tell me, tell me a little bit about that and any other sort of stress management tips maybe you've been withholding from me. Because yes. <laughs> maybe I could have used that or can still use it. Well, you know, everybody is very good at being backstage and thinking about things. But sometimes when you... You go out on the stage, people get nervous, they stumble, you know, and, and it's that way in all walks of life. And, you know, you need certain ways to make sure you're grounded. And I learned that I, I could figure out all kinds of stuff, but in the heat of battle, if you were, with people, you know, sort of unhappy or they have nasty faces or they raise their voices, you just as a person recoil from that and you realize you're being attacked. And then that brings, you know, sort of adrenaline into play. And when that happens, 
you know, the, I think the blood is going to your musculature and it's not going to your brain in the same amount. And so, so you have to normalize uh, stress. And if, if, if you're in an occupation where you're regularly in stress, you have to figure out how, how to not, you know, sort of not be comfortable. And, and so, you know, I've, I've developed little tips. I always try and think through, you know, like actually it happens to me when I'm sleeping, but, you know, different scenarios of what's going to happen so, so that you accommodate to the future that hasn't happened. But usually there are only a few different alternatives. And then when you get involved with things, you have to make sure you're always calm. And you can let other people get excited, but it's going to be one of those scenarios probably. And your job is, is always to keep perspective, to listen to what's going on, and then say things to change where that dialogue is going. And there's a time to interrupt somebody. There's a time to just let them play it out. And if, if you're enmeshed in the whole thing, you're not going to get your timing right. So, so I've learned to observe what's going on. And sometimes it's a situation where people are tentative and you need to be in control of that situation. You need to take control. If there's a really aggressive person and you try and do that, then you'll be in conflict with them and then you have to retreat and let them put their wares on the table, whether they're sensible or not, and then you play it differently. So all of these dynamic situations are actually fun because you never know exactly the way they're going to evolve and and that's what makes it interesting. And you want to make sure you're progressing whatever dialogue you have and keeping it on track. And by watching and inserting yourself when it's productive, but withdrawing when things are going fine, that, that's the way you do it. This now clarifies to me why no matter what shocking news I may have told you at any point in my life, your response is always, really? <laughs> and you just nod and wait. So it all makes sense now. Speaking of sleep, I think I heard at HBS or in some study or something that the one thing that differentiates really successful people from other people when they've factored everything else out is their need for sleep and that people who need less sleep are more productive and successful in life. And in the book it says, and as of course I know, you don't need that much sleep. You get about five hours a night. What do you think about that theory? I, I think that theory makes arithmetic sense because if you're, you're just as good as somebody else but you're awake for three hours longer, you have a competitive advantage. In my case, it's even worse because when I'm supposedly sleeping, I'm thinking about things. So, so I, you know, for, for me, it's, it's all sort of a continuum. And that does give you the ability to sort of have more time to be doing things. But it's also when, when you're asleep, and I don't think it's time determined, you're not under the pressure of more inputs. So your brain can process things and sort them out in a way that when you are awake, there, there's so much stimuli coming in that it's hard to take it in and reflect on exactly where you should be going strategically on something. So this doesn't mean that people who want to be more successful should set their alarms earlier? No, because, <laughs> because everybody's got their own circadian rhythms. And, I'm just kidding. And I'm you have kidding. to play the, the way your body tells you you can do it. And what about coming up with ideas? Because you're always thinking, you're always coming up with something new. It sounds like a lot when you're sleeping. How do you get these ideas to just percolate? Does it just happen to some people and not other people? Is there things you do to help it? Well, I have certain weaknesses that, you know, I remember reading Proust and and thinking, how could I be productive in in a cork line room with no stimuli? And I realized I I don't know how to think great thoughts. I, I need things to happen. I need input. I need information. And and so in my business, which is called Blackstone, I set it up so I could get the maximum number of feeds, the maximum amount of information. Because once you have enormous amounts of information flowing all the time, it's easy to think about new things. It's easy to see the relationships 
It's, it's not a challenge. If, if I were just left on my own in a desert island, I, I can assure you I would come up with nothing. And I'm not even mechanical, so I probably couldn't even get a coconut. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 you know, that, that's really how it works. So on your 60th birthday, you reflected on parenting, which was a passage of particular interest to me. And you said, as a parent, you strive for balance between doing enough at work to succeed and being there in person for your family, emotionally available for your kids. At the time, you never know if you're doing a good job. The reckoning comes years later. Looking back on the night of my 60th and the memories of those closest to me, I didn't think I'd done too badly. Too badly, or so (laughs) badly, that's like, okay, thanks. (laughs) But seriously, you know, you have always made a point of whenever I call, taking my calls and showing me as a daughter that I'm a priority. And now I have four of my own kids and everybody's lost in their busy lives in some way or another. What are your strategies or tips or what have you learned? What do you wish, is there anything you wish you'd done differently? What advice would you have for people who are in your spot now? Well, I think it's, uh, first of all, it's very important to let your children know that you love them and that's unqualified love. And that's a good foundation. Not all parents do that. Secondly, you, you want to spend enough time with, with your children so they get to know you, they get to understand, you know, sort of your values, and you're around to give them advice and help them. When I made those comments at my 60th birthday, the, the, the issue is, you know, were you around enough? Did you help enough? And as the parent, you never know what's what's going on with your child and what they're taking in and whether you should be available more or you should have said something different or you should have handled a situation differently you 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 know all parents we you know we're like parents in effect for the first time and we we do the best we can and so i I've, I've had two excellent outcomes <laughs> so 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 it, it was it, that was good but you always worry you know am am i doing the right thing time was. So, you know, I I went out of my way to go to some of the sports things where probably didn't matter, but I just wanted to be there to support my children because I love them. And I wanted them to understand, even if I was on the phone trying to do some kind of transaction, which was my job, I was there. And I saw what they were doing and I was supporting them. Now, would I have been a better parent if I wasn't on the phone and, you know, was just looking like the other parents and cheering every time? I would cheer when they did something well. I mean, that was, you know, that wasn't the issue. So you never know as a parent. Well, I think you did a nice job. (laughs) I feel very lucky. You told a story, to go back to your training a little bit, you told a story about your freshman year English teacher. And I want to hear a little bit more about the writing of this book. Because when you got to Yale, your English teacher gave you like a 68 or something on a paper. And when you went to talk to him, he was going to get upset with you. And you said, no, I had nothing to say. And I said it badly. And he taught you how to write. What do you think your English teacher would say about this book? What grade do you think he would he, he would give you? Well, I think he'd definitely give me an A to A plus. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> be, be, because this has the advantage of not just being me, but it's all these different people who've been involved and, you know, having an editor, you know, who's really extremely gifted can have a sentence that you think is really good. And by the time they move one word around and, cha- and change the phrasing slightly, all of a sudden it sings. And, and so writing isn't as isolated a sport. It's more of a team sport than I thought. And, and, and so, you know, it's difficult to write. But... That professor saved me. I, I wouldn't have made it, you know, past my first year in college. I had a 68 on the first English paper, 66 on the second. This is a bad starting point and the wrong trend, <laughs> right? And he saved me. And I, I ended up on Dean's List by the end of the first year. So I wasn't stupid, but this wasn't a game I was used to playing at a level of a, a great university. And now you've taken education on is one of your biggest causes. I feel like you've benefited so much from your education. You're always talking about how much it has shaped you. Is that why you think you've pursued education as your major? Yeah, because I, I think it, it's, it's really a right. And it's like sort of like health. And, you know, if you don't have a good education, particularly in a information-based society as we're moving into it, 
your ability to be successful unless you happen to have a great odd skill of being an athlete or an entertainer or something of that type, it's going to be harder and harder. And so we have an obligation to make sure that everybody has the opportunity for self-actualization and the ability to have lifetime learning. To the extent we don't provide it as a country, we will not be competitive. You know, as individuals, we will have less than optimal outcomes. And so that's a worthy thing to be focused on. And it took you more or less 10 years to write this book, even though most of it you have dictated, which is unique, I feel like. You dictate everything, you don't write it down, it just comes out of your mouth, kind of perfectly shaped. How do you do that? Well, th this wasn't exactly that easy. But, you know, I, I did sort of, you know, I, one of my friends, Hank Paulson, told me I should keep notes because I'd forget things. As it works out, I don't forget much. Uh, I'm lucky like that. But, you know, I had, you know, a, a, a guy who was a journalist who would follow me around a bit. And if I was flying someplace, you know, he'd ask me about what happened in this year or what happened chronologically. And so we got that out and there were a bunch of tra transcripts. And, and then, you know, I had somebody work with me to organize that and figured out, I figured out which things should be in that. And he took a draft and was good. But writing is a peculiar thing. Unless you do the thing yourself, it won't be your voice. It'll be somebody else's voice, could be good, but it doesn't have that authentic aspect where somebody says, yeah, that is you, that's what you think. And, and so, you know, I had to go over this and, and it wasn't quite so easy as, uh, you know, to sort of turn this into my voice. And I find writing, and you've always been really good at it, I find writing incredibly painful. I, I like talking, I like doing videos, but writing is hard because every word has to be right. Every phrase has to be right, saying what you really think. Because if your objective is to expose it to really smart people and, and you're not telling them sort of what to think because you got the wrong words, then they're not either gonna like it or you won't be able to communicate. And so this was really tough. I mean, the writing part was over three years, and I, I can't tell you how many times I had to read this book, What It Takes. Even picking the name was months, and every aspect of this was painful. The reason I'm excited now, you can hear it in my voice, is I'm done. <laughs> uh, and, and everyone I've exposed it to thinks it's it's terrific. You know, it's inspirational. It's an easy read. It's funny. And you don't have to be a business person to like this. So I'm totally pleased with that outcome. You should be. That's awesome. So I have to say I'm pleased because I've watched a lot of interviews you've done. And almost every time when someone asks you a question, you say, well, the real question is da da da, da and, you, and you ask another question. So I'm relieved that you haven't turned around any of my questions <laughs> to, to, to ask you what the real question is. So my last question, if I can get away with one more, is what advice you would have to aspiring authors out there, but also to someone who's trying to make a mark on the world in the way that you have? Well, for, the, for aspiring authors, the, the process is so long and painful. <laughs> it that, doesn't ask that, me that bad. That, that, that you really have to have something to say. Why are you spending so much of your life doing this? And what do you want to communicate to somebody else? And you really ought to know that before you start. And, and then it's just a question of figuring out the route uh, to do it. As, as to, to people trying you know, more starting out or restarting their lives on some level. You know, in terms of advice, be, be careful about what you're spending your time on. And know who you are and know what you're good at and pick something that fits you. Not something that somebody says, you, you, you should be working at this company because it's a good company. I've found that that unless you're abnormally gifted and can do everything, which is sort of very few people, that individuals have things that they're much better at. 
and it's what they love doing. And when somebody says, well, that's interesting but irrelevant, you know, you should be doing something else, you, you have to get back to where you have a passion. You have to be back to where you have a gift because uh, everyone isn't the same. Time goes really fast when you're doing something you love. Time is really endless when you're doing something you don't. And, and so you have to just find that match between your gifts and everybody has something that they're, they're good at, that they love. You know, you have to identify that and find a path to integrate that with the opportunities in the society. Excellent. Well, thanks, Dad. Thanks for coming on Moms No Time to Read Books. Thanks for writing this amazing book. And thanks for being my dad. I love you, Zip. Oh, I love you, too. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You can always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 